In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You can be seated. My dear friends, first day in our Lenten retreat, we were mentioning the battles, the inner battle and the outer battle we all as Christians go through. And you better come to know that you are in the midst of this kind of battle. I think it is not good that many Catholics are not fully aware that they are in the midst of the battle. And that's not good because they probably will be hurt or their faith can be destroyed. They could be killed even, spiritually speaking. So that was the first night mentioning the inner and the outer battles. The second night was about taking a stance, taking a clear position, and that means that entails embracing some options. To be clear about that, we have to recognize what makes Christ really different from other spiritual leaders. So we were mentioning that we, and providing some explanation the aim for last night's encounter gathering was that we come to a fuller appreciation of our faith. The more we appreciate, the more we thank God for the faith we have received, the more we are ready to embrace our faith, to defend it in good terms with everybody, and also to present, to offer to others what we have received because it is not fair, it wouldn't be just, <clears throat> having received all this wealth of wisdom, just to keep all that for ourselves. We are called by the very impulse, by the very momentum of God's love, God's stream of love, we are invited to share what we have received. To, to spread the good news, to become evangelizers. And that's the call that we were reminded yesterday. Today, coming to the end of this short Lenten retreat, we are to meditate a little bit about hope, which is a very important message nowadays. Because if you see around, there is not certain, certainly there's not many people speaking of hope. The word that you and I have heard so often during these last years, and now it is years, is the word crisis, financial crisis. And sometimes it gets worse because it is not financial crisis, it is financial cliff. So it moves from bad to worse and then from worse to worst. But there's no many people 
Speaking of hope and bringing hope to the arena, we have to regard ourselves as very blessed people. We have to see ourselves as really fortunate because we have received a message that prepares us to bring hope not only to our own souls, to our own families, but even to society at large. And it is my expectation, it is my hope, that you come also to this realization and you decide by yourself that you have so much to transmit, so much to pass over to others, to your neighbors. So my friends, how, how to build that hope? First thing we have to bear in mind is that hope is very different. Even it is the opposite of fantasy, illusion, or wishful thinking. When we as Christians speak of hope, we are not telling a fairy tale about how beautiful the world could be, might be, would have come to be, or probably would have been this conditional, this hypothetical language is not the language of hope. Hope in Christian terms is not what I would like to see or what I wish would be possible. It is not that kind of language, my friends. Hope has a very solid foundation. It is not illusion, it is not fantasy. It is as real, it is as solid as the foundation of our Christian faith. And Christian faith has a powerful foundation in the fact that we have been actually really loved. And that love has been manifested in the person of Jesus Christ. So when we speak of hope, we are not speaking of desires possibilities, hypotheses, or conditional language. When we speak of hope, we speak of a foundation that is real and that has a basis, has a solid, solid foundation in Jesus. How was it possible? Well, we have to take a glance on the Gospels and very soon we realize what kind of transformation Jesus brings to people's lives. To have something definite in mind, it is good to focus ourselves in just four words. And that's what I am ready to do with the help of God in this first talk. For the second talk, we'll take a different text from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. But by the time being, we take four expressions, four terms that are very central in Jesus' ministry according to the presentation of the Gospels. What are those terms? Well, let's take healing. Healing. This is something that is very close to Jesus. Wherever Jesus goes, people gather, and the first reason they gather around him is that they wish to be healed. And please listen to this. There's no reason whatsoever to say that Jesus has changed. All the contrary, in the letter to the Hebrews, we read, that is in chapter 12, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus has not changed. Which means that wherever Jesus goes and whenever Jesus is present, healing is at hand. And healing is a very solid foundation for hope because sickness, illness, infirmity, it's a condition, it's a very human condition, but it is a condition that makes the future to look very dark, very, very somber. 
when we see the future through the lens of infirmity, we recognize most probably I will not be able to make it. I have not enough strength to make it. Even if we go to the etymology of the word infirmity, it means what is not firm. Infirmity is what is not firm. By the contrary, when we receive healing, healing makes us not only whole, not only restores the wholeness of our life, but also restores our confidence that yes, we can make it. Yes, I can look into the future. I can see the future in the eye and I can trust that I will make it. There's a possibility. There is a future for me. There is a future. So healing is a very powerful action of God that not only changes what I have in the present, but changes the way I see the future. And of course, we are speaking not only of physical healing, which is important, and God continues to heal people in their bodies, but that we are not just speaking of that kind of healing. We're speaking as well of emotional healing. We are, we're speaking of healing of memories. So many emotional, so many inner wounds people carry around for years and years and years. Isn't it good to be healed of all that and to experience that we can see into the future with complete confidence that the same Lord that has guided so far up to this point will continue to be with us in the future. Not only the immediate future, but even in long distance future. This is possible once a person has had the experience of being healed. And healing is very important in the gospel. We can say that it is one of the four, one of the four central actions, central axis of action in Jesus' ministry. The second one I have to mention is forgiving. Guilt, guilt is very, very powerful in restraining our capacity of moving forward. Resentment, hatred, and conscience, bad conscience are really effective in stopping us in our tracks. They are really powerful in stopping us. And you see that when a person is dealing with a very difficult emotional situation. Think, for example, of a person that is dealing with divorce, divorce. This person that has a separation, most of his conscious time, this person is thinking, is just continuing the endless arguments with his or her ex. So that hours, every day, this person is thinking, well, actually, it was her fault. It was his fault. No, it was mine. Or probably was his, was mine, was her. Was hers, or was mine. And that discussion and that permanent, that endless argument running on and on in your mind is really draining, is really sucking the power, the energy you need for better purposes. Which means that a person that is not in peace with herself or with himself, that person is kind of in shackles. That person is in chains. That person cannot move freely. It is a constant obstacle. And 
especially when we have involved our heart in a relationship and things didn't go well, it is not only the problem of losing somebody. That person I am now separated from, that person was very important for me. So it is terrible loss not to have that person in my life. That's not the only problem. The problem is that losing that person also tells a very bad story, a very sad story about myself. What's wrong with me? How was it that I couldn't be able to keep that person close to me? What was wrong with me? What did I do? What had I... What should I have done that I didn't? That kind of questions are really powerful in draining out our energy, in stopping our possibility of looking with confidence into the future. When a person is going through this kind of process, we recognize that she or he is not able to see the future with confidence. How can you be trustful in yourself? How can you be self-confident if you, all the time you are full of doubt about, am I really the right person for whom? What kind of person might be adequate, might be convenient for a person like me? I didn't know myself as good as I thought I did. So, I, so what, what relationship would be good for me? And this kind of inner, this kind of inner discussion, inner argument going on and on in your brain is draining, is draining your energy out. Well, I've given the example of this relationship in a couple, but the same holds true if you think, for example, of a parent thinking of his children, her children, in the sense of suffering that they are so far and they didn't seem to care, not even a bit. So it seems that I'm not important for them. So what kind of parent was I? What did I do? What kind of family we had? Was a real family? Was a bad family? What was the problem? What was wrong with us? Because we are so completely spread out. There's so little communication. It is so difficult to gather people. There's constant quarrels and discussions. What was bad? And when we have this kind of questioning, powerful questioning, it is really difficult to look into the future. I have not a magic bullet to solve these kind of questions. I have no magic solution for that. But one thing I can say, and that thing is, the very beginning of a new, of a fresh start in those circumstances is forgiveness. Think of the power of the sacrament of reconciliation that we mentioned from the very beginning of this retreat. The sacrament of reconciliation is a marvelous, it's a really wonderful way of having a fresh start because well celebrated, well known, the sacrament of confession, sacrament of reconciliation, is, a, is an opportunity, is a real opportunity of making a real balance, admitting what I have to admit, being true to myself, being true to God, recognizing what I have to recognize, and when you do that, you have the possibility of putting your mind to some deserved rest. You need some rest. It is not that you lose interest 
in whatever wrong happened in the past. But even to examine that past with new eyes, you need a fresh start. So recognizing that we really, we really were wrong in many aspects and examining our conscience and coming to the conclusion that we need forgiveness is a really step forward. It's really good for us. That's the very beginning. And that's what Jesus offered to many people according to the Gospels. Even if that offering of forgiveness became scandalous for some at that time, who is this that pretends to forgive? They were not, they were not very ready to admit that he had that kind of power. So this is healing, that was the first one. Forgiving, that's the second one. Now let's move to number three. Casting the evil one. Deliverance. That was part of Jesus' ministry. Deliverance. Regarding deliverance, many people are at one of two extremes. For some people, everything has a reason in the action of the devil. So if I smoke, it is the devil trying to destroy my lungs. If I overate, it was the devil that was making me too hungry. It is like handing over our own responsibility to the devil. That's an exaggeration. That's not the position of the Catholic Church, but some people think that way. At the other extreme, there are people that are denying the very existence of the devil and of every spirit, because actually, the kind of world they think of is just matter. They are materialistic. Even if they say they are Catholics or they are Christians, they only believe in what senses can perceive so that they are not admitting any angel, not even fallen angels, which is the case with the devil. These two extremes are far away from our Catholic faith. What we admit instead is that there are fallen angels, we usually call them demons or devils, and we know that they have some influence, some possible influence in some cases. And we can need deliverance, we can need it, that's true. Deliverance is not exactly the same as an exorcism. Exorcism is a sacramental, not a sacrament, it is a sacramental whose purpose is to cast out, to expulse the devil when there is conviction that the devil has grabbed, kind of grabbed the will of somebody. This is very rare. Very, very rare. It could happen. It happens. But it is very rare. So I am not directly mentioning or alluding to this kind of situation. What I am saying is that, as the Apostle St. Paul says in chapter 6 of the letter to the Ephesians, our fight is not just against people. In my country, I am from Colombia, South America. In my country, we have many sorts of problems, different kinds of situations. And probably you know very well that we have gorillas in Colombia. The best known of them is the FARC, F-A-R-C, 
and that stands for Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, Armed Force of Colombia, Fuerzas Armadas Revolucionarias de Colombia, that's FARC. And, well, FARC are, are, really, are really powerful. I suppose they are less powerful now. In my mind, in my eyes, there's no possibility of they grabbing power, real power, political power in Colombia. But they have um, kidnapped a lot of people and they can cause some damage in many towns to some civil population. When you have drug trade, when you have guerrillas, when you have paramilitary groups, when you have some political corruption, you are tempted to say that the enemy of Colombia are the guerrillas, the enemy in Colombia are some politicians of this political party, of that political party. Or you can say that drug traders are the real enemy in Colombia. I'm taking this example from my country to highlight this aspect. Even if we recognize that there are criminal people and really wicked, wicked people, there is a risk of saying that the real problem and the real cause are they. And when we say that, then we begin to think of ourselves as judges with the capacity of condemning them and destroying them. And that's a source of hatred and that's a source of further division in a country. So it is important to be reminded that the origin of everything evil is not in the human heart. Even if we come to know really, really bad people, really wicked people, it is good to be reminded that the human heart is not the ultimate source, is not the ultimate explanation of that wickedness. When we come to understand that there is action regretful and horrible, but real action that has its origin in the evil one, when we recognize that, we also recognize that wicked people, no matter how bad they are, they are the first victims of their own wickedness. That's the Christian position. Not many are ready to accept that, but that's the Christian position. And that's what the Lord taught us when, we, when he was about to die on the cross. When he was being crucified, he prayed for those who were killing him. How was that possible? How was it that Jesus didn't consider them his enemies. Well, the reason is that even if they were so cruel, if they were so lacking in every kind of human feeling, because this was not a case of mercy, it was just a case of being human, and they were not human in their behavior, in their actions, Jesus was able to pray for them because Jesus was able to recognize that they were the first victims of their own wickedness. So they, they deserve, of course, they deserve to be punished and they deserve to be castigated and probably to be jailed and all that. I'm not saying that they are innocent. Of course I am not. I'm not saying that the guerrillas or the paramilitary groups in Colombia are innocent. I am not. What I am saying is that from a Christian perspective, all the wrongness, all the wickedness that we can see in people like these criminals, all that wickedness has a further 
source. And if we are to be fair, and if we are to be Christians, we have to look for that source that is even farther. Only from that perspective, we can understand that they deserve punishment, but before that, or alongside that, they deserve prayer. Prayer. We have to pray for them. And this is true for a country like Colombia, but this is true also for your family. Can you imagine how much a human life can be destroyed just for repeating once and again, my father was a disaster as a father. I didn't deserve that. I hate him. You know how much in a human life can be destroyed just by repeating that kind of mantra. I hate him. That kind of thought comes from assigning all the guilt and all the wickedness to that heart. From a, Christian's per from a Christian perspective, instead, what we have is the awareness that, of course, that person was a disaster. Of course he was. Of course he was. We are not denying the facts. Of course he was a very bad father. We can also come to that point and say that. But the important thing is to realize that the first one that was destroyed, that was affected by his wrongness, the first one that was destroyed by his wickedness was himself. When we come to realize this, we understand that probably he deserves punishment, but he also deserves prayer. And if you push me a little bit, I'll say it. He also deserves compassion. And that's, a, and that's the, the very fruit of acknowledging that the wickedness that is around in the world comes not immediately from the human heart. The wickedness that is acting in the world has a different origin. And the ministry of deliverance, the ministry of casting out the devil, is a very healthy reminder that we shouldn't treat the human being as the ultimate source of what is evil. When Jesus, when Jesus did this part of his ministry, he was not only having compassion of those who were possessed by the devil. He was teaching us something that is very, very essential. He was teaching us that we should always remember that the origin of wickedness is not entirely in the human heart, which means that no human being, no human being deserves only punishment. Every human being has the right to expect from us, if we are Christians, to expect from us some sort of prayer, some drops of mercy and compassion. The fourth activity that we see in Jesus' ministry and that is, um, that is completing the foundation of Christian hope is teaching. Let's be reminded about the four. First one, healing. Second one, forgiving. Third one, casting the devil, casting the evil one. And number four, teaching. Teaching is also a source of hope because Jesus' teaching 
Go straight into what really matters in human life. Jesus' teaching was not about himself. Jesus' teaching was not directly about God as a professor of theology. Jesus' teaching was about the kingdom of God. Jesus' teaching was about how God comes and how God comes into our lives, heals, forgives, purifies, transforms. Jesus' teaching about the kingdom of God is a way of re-establishing. It is, it is a way of recreating what was destroyed by sin. And this is exactly the kind of guidance we needed. This is exactly the kind of guidance that can make our lives different from a really, really profound point of view. Jesus' teaching occupies so many hours of his ministry in very, very simple words, using everyday comparison with ordinary things, Jesus is, we can say, training our eyes to recognize in the simplest things of life how God is present. Let me expand a little bit this idea. Take the parables. Many people think of the parables as a means of pedagogical exposition or explanation. Many people think that the parables were some pedagogical resource that Jesus used in order to put in a graphic in a visual way, I mean, in a visual way, what he was trying to say. Take, for example, the parable of the sower, one of the best knowns, no doubt about that. The parable of the sower, for many people, is just a way of visualizing, giving some visual aid for your mind so that you can relate the different kind of listeners to different kinds of soils or terrains. That's a way of seeing it. But perhaps there's more to that than it seems. Because we see that Jesus' parables always, with no exception, refer to things that might happen or have happened. The shepherd and the flock, the pearl, the sower, the leaven. It is always about everyday things, ordinary things, things that are around, around us. If, if Jesus' intention were just to provide some visual aid for us to understand a very ab abstract or abstruse teaching, he might use animals with the gift of speaking as Esopus did. You know, the fables. The fox was speaking to the monkey, or the, the um, this um, bird was speaking to the turtle. This is not the case with Jesus. He's not appealing to our imagination. He is using what we have at hand. So what Jesus is doing with his teaching is helping us 
to relearn the world from a new perspective. It is as if Jesus was telling us, have you seen the shepherd and the flock? Many times, of course, Jesus, okay. Have you seen the shepherd and the flock from this perspective? Have you ever lost a coin? Of course, Jesus, I have many times. Okay, now see the lost coin from this perspective. Have you seen the sower throwing out the seed? Have you seen that? Of course, Jesus, many times. Okay, now let's see that scene from this perspective. Jesus' is teaching is not only a visual aid for us to understand, it is about training our eyes so that we can see the same world that we already have seen so many times, to see the world, this old world, and my old life, and my old family, and my old country, to see what I have seen, but to see it in a new way. And that's the transformation of Jesus' teaching. It's about changing the way we see what we have already seen. And that's kind of healing for our eyes. Have you really seen what I am seeing? That's the question that Jesus, the one with clear eyes, is asking. And with every teaching, he is helping us recognize that God is already present in the simplest aspects of our lives. So this is the this is a tremendous, this is a dramatic difference if we can pair Jesus with other leaders, spiritual leaders and teachers. Most spiritual leaders are bringing new things to our lives, do this and do that. Jesus, rather than bringing new things to our lives, bring new eyes so that we can recognize the newness of God's presence that was there, but we were not seeing that. So Jesus' teaching is the healing of our spiritual sight in such a way that we can recognize, we can appreciate what we weren't able to before. One last example about this on teaching. Think of a person that receives wonderful news, wonderful news. For example, yesterday he was a very normal guy, but today something really special has happened to him. Today, that person that was so important for him did accept him. That person, which is the most beautiful, the most charming person in the world, now has said, you two are so important for me. So now this guy is the same person that he was yesterday, but today he is in love. And when that person, when that man is in love, he sees a different world, and it is the same world, but he sees the world in a very different way. So now the sky is bluer, have I to say, and now the roses are brighter, and now the breeze is refreshing and nice, it is not terrible, and what kind of weather is this one? No, that is the breeze. Now it is 
like some caress from God. What he has received from his experience, from his inner transformation, is a new perception, a new way of perceiving the world. That's what Jesus brings to our life with his teaching. He gives us the possibility of seeing the same world, recognizing how the seeds of goodness, the seeds of hope, the seeds of tenderness, the seeds of faithfulness are also growing up. It is not that we are denying all the terrible news that CNN and MSNBC and all the channel, the channels of news are telling us Yes, it is true, there are massacres. Yes, it is true, there is corruption, political division, killing, mismanagement of resources. Yes, yes, and yes, that's true. But what Jesus brings to our minds, it is not denying that aspect of reality, but driving our attention to other aspects and those other aspects are the ones that are telling us how hope is also blossoming. It, it is about seeing that goodness also has its opportunity, that there is so much to be grateful for. There's so much to be hopeful about. There's so much to be in love with God. And also, there's so much to see in humanity a possibility for a future. No, we don't deny. We don't deny everything that is wrong and everything that is wicked. We don't deny that. But we have, we've got new eyes to recognize how good is also growing up. And we see in so many instances that goodness overcomes what is wicked and what is bad and what is sad. And with every tiny victory, our hope increases. Healing, forgiving, casting the evil one, and teaching, teaching us how to see the world. These are the kind of actions, these are the kind of deeds that Jesus did. Actions and deeds that really transform our way of seeing the world and seeing ourselves. And when we are so transformed, we are ready to build up the city of hope. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, 